Hello there and welcome to What's the Point? A question we should all be asking ourselves and the podcast by brand architect Bill Ellis that will help you discover, clarify and live your purpose. Hi everybody and welcome back to What's the Point? Another incredibly exciting guest today. Uh, someone who's very unusual, both in uh, in context of what the guest I've typically had, but also just in general. Uh, Ron Radford, welcome to What's the Point? I appreciate your time. Thank you. Good to be with you, Bill. Look forward to having the chat. Yeah, so, so Ron is interesting in any number of ways, not the least of which is he is a world-renowned uh, talent on the flamenco guitar. And that is kind of makes him unique in and of itself. But what makes him more unique, Ron, is that you started playing the guitar in Oklahoma, of all places, the flamenco guitar. Yeah. Share with us how that came to be, because that, that's not a real common uh, uh, choice there, I wouldn't think. No, you, you don't have any flamenco clubs in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to, to, to go hang out with the gypsies, no. Um, I started out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with a very musical mother, who played the piano by ear and would uh, have us, you know, hang around and sing. And then by the time I was seven years old, uh, her main instrument uh, was the ukulele. And so she taught me to play it within three months. I knew all the songs that she had learned back in the twenties as a flapper. Uh, she was a genuine uh, uh, flapper anyway. So I became uh, well-known uh, by the time I was eight, uh, playing the ukulele on kid shows on television uh, and, uh, if, in Tulsa. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, right there. Yeah, okay. yeah that's that's the place. Uh, uh, and uh, I uh, uh, wanted to expand my musical uh, abilities because I just love music. I found a way to connect with people through music. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a way of overcoming a lot of dysfunctional uh, kind of emotional stuff with our family. And I found out that, hey, you can go and connect with people and make people happy by playing music and they give you good feedback. And it was a wonderful experience. And so then I got into playing the piano uh, for uh, a couple of years, studied classical piano with William Walter Perry in Tulsa. And then I studied cello and played cello in a junior high school orchestra in Tulsa. And then by the time I was, uh, I guess, 14, uh, I just begged my mom and dad to get me a guitar, and uh, and so uh, I did get a guitar for my 14th birthday, and immediately launched into rock and roll and imitating Elvis and uh, <laughs> Chuck Berry, and you know uh, had a little rock and roll band, uh, and then after, uh, uh, gosh, I guess almost two and a half years. Well, by the time I was 17, uh, we were on a summer. Uh, vacation. We used to go fishing in Minnesota. My dad was a was a big fishing fan, and he arranged it so we could take off and have a three month vacation in the summer. So, I was busy working okay. on my electric guitar one day in Minnesota on, on in a cabin on the lake. And my mom had been out shopping. She brought a record home from uh, the grocery store at the Chippewa Indian town of Cass Lake, and it was a recording of Carlos Montoya. Had a picture of a guitar on the album cover, and I. The way she tells, she said, well, I thought, you know, my guitar playing son, maybe he'll like this. She didn't even know what it was. So okay. immediately upon putting this 30, 33 RPM album on my portable record player, and I first heard the sounds of flamenco music on that recording, and it just completely blew my mind. It was like I spent all day listening to that same record over and over again, and then the rest of the summer, listening to that same record over and over again at full volume. Okay. Driving. Hey, hey Ron, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just for for the, the sake of uh, some of our listeners, they may be hearing things that they've not heard before, like a 33 and a third record and a record player. <laughs> so yeah. let's set the stage a little bit and put this in a context of time frame. Uh, what year about was this? And uh, we're talking, we're talking 1961, the summer of okay. 1961. And, uh, and so, when I tell that story in, uh, in uh, school shows or concerts, I'll say you re some of you remember those things that used to go round and round, and you put a needle down on it, and and it 
and it scraped through the grooves. Anyway, <laughs> it's very primitive. And a lot of people have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> the digital age. We used to have these things called records, and you had to you had to put a a little arm with a needle on it, and it and it rotated as the as the yeah. as it rotated around. It actually created the vibrations. Good sound actually on those old records. But anyway, long story short, I got home to Tulsa uh, at the end of that vacation completely enamored of I never played another note of rock and roll music and I was a good rock and roll player at the time all I wanted to do was figure out how to play this amazing deeply emotional um just incredible music it just touched my heart it made me feel uh, awakened uh, artistically and emotionally in a way that I had never felt before uh, music has an amazing power to do that awesome. and each of us has a different style of music or tonalities that seem to push our buttons. Well, this one sure pushed mine. It was like I, I felt connected to a culture that I actually knew. It's as though I knew these people who were playing this music, these gypsies from Spain. I didn't know how, why, or where, but all I knew was, man, this is the thing for me. And I spent um, the rest of that year, uh, first of all, I sold my electric guitar an amplifier and i got a nylon string guitar from rose's pawn shop downtown which is still in tulsa by the way since 1961 and uh that, that nylon string guitar because that's what uh, uh i found out you had to have you know uh couldn't play it on steel strings i wondered why i wasn't sounding right and uh, let me interrupt you just again quickly my apologies but sure. um for myself, who is a complete uh, novice at best and uneducated when it comes to different types of guitars, I know electric, I know acoustic, and that's where it ends. Right. But also for, for the benefit of our listeners, is there typically a specific guitar that is a flamenco guitar? So were you, were you learning flamenco music on a standard acoustic guitar versus a more specialized instrument? Uh, no, I'll... I, I was sort of on an in-between. The only thing available for me to learn on in the authentic way with the finger style on nylon guitar strings was on a, an, a very inexpensive classical guitar. It was $15, in fact. Somebody had put it at the pawn shop. Um, so a classical guitar has a wider neck and it uses nylon guitar strings as opposed to steel strings. An acoustic guitar simply means any guitar that is not amplified. So okay. a nylon string guitar could be a folk guitar with a narrower neck, and there are some of those that were made by Martin and other companies that people would recognize. But the one I got was actually made in Mexico. It was just, just an old-school Mexican classical guitar, and I, uh, I worked on it. Uh, and uh, found that it came closer to matching the sounds on the recordings. Okay. I found other recordings from uh, the uh, wife of a uh, owner of a Mexican restaurant in town who happened to be a big Hispanophile, loved Spanish stuff. So she had some authentic flamenco records uh, other than the one that my mother had purchased that I'd just worn out by this time. <laughs> so I kept listening to other recordings and I could start hearing nuances and different uh rhythm patterns and uh and then another guy i ran into actually had a book about flamenco with some samples and i started working on that and trying to figure out how they were structured you know the way the phrases were done and the rhythm patterns so i was working on that and uh played it well enough where people wanted to hear me play what little bit i knew and i didn't at the time i hardly even knew the names of the rhythm patterns or the song styles uh, okay uh, and uh, but I I knew how to play them um, and some of them were were really tricky gypsy rhythms uh, 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 that are that are composite rhythms you know what a, a waltz is like one two three one two three mm -hmm. and a march is like one two three four five six one two three four five six okay so one of the flamenco rhythms is is a combination. It alternates with three and then the six. So it's an odd kind of a composite rhythm. Well, I was very challenged by that one, and I finally mastered it, playing a few variations. And the variations are phrases of music, which in Spain uh, or in flamenco uh, literature is called a falsetta. 
and a falsetta is a phrase of music. And it's sort of like the trade and stock of flamenco style on the guitar are learning to play these falsettas or little musical phrases, uh, some of which are multiple phrases that go together to create a musical theme. Um, and I was getting pretty good at uh, learning some of that from these old recordings. Uh, then as I was getting ready to graduate from high school, uh, from Will Rogers High School in Tulsa, and I'd played at a big talent show for the high school and for some other uh, organizations in town uh, that had known about me and they had me come and I would tell a little bit about flamenco, what little I had read on the album covers. That was my education because uh, yeah. you know, it was really difficult to find any information. And somebody told me that Carlos Montoya, the original inspiration, this old gentleman from Spain, who's a full blood gypsy who ended up living in New York City and was promoted by Saul Hurok, uh, one of the great impresarios back in the 50s and 60s. And he had toured all over the world uh, in hundreds of cities uh, as the really only full-time touring concert flamenco guitarist that is performing flamenco guitar as a solo art form. Whereas in Spain, it's considered to be a part of an ensemble that includes the singing and then the dancing, the flamenco dancers, uh, and then the guitar accompanying them. And that's the way the culture of Spain developed. But along about the 1930s, Carlos Montoya's uncle, that is the uncle of the guy whose original recording I heard, who's the world okay. guy at that time, um, he played the very first solo flamenco guitar concert in 1930. This is how far back it goes. And some people think that seems really rather modern because if solo flamenco guitar playing, that is somebody sitting on stage and just playing flamenco guitar without a singer, without a dancer, not a whole show, but just guitar music, that didn't happen until 1930. He was a genius, a great composer and artist, an improviser, and uh, they did a couple of recordings of him, and he's the one that set the stage and started the uh, the whole tradition of solo flamenco guitar playing. And I didn't know any of that at the time. All I knew was that Carlos Montoya was coming to town and playing a concert. So, wow, we got tickets and I was so excited. Then some people found out that I was going and they said, oh, well, we helped to book him and we let the management company that booked him know. And so they arranged for me to meet him backstage. Wow, that's cool. So that was that was the thing that really turned the tide. I was so excited. I met Carlos Montoya uh, before his concert. I by this time I had graduated to a fifty dollar guitar <laughs> that my that my dad had had this guy uh, at the Mexican restaurant uh, buy for me on one of his trips to Mexico. A little bit better guitar, still in, you know traditional classical nylon string. Right. Not really a flamenco guitar. And I played for him backstage. I took my guitar out and, and started playing the rhythm that I was telling you about, the one that's the composite rhythm of the three, four, six, eight yeah. rhythm. And he was just astonished that I that I knew it. And he did a double take. He got his guitar out of his case. And this is 30 minutes before the concert. And he starts playing along with me and, you know, showing me some things. And then his wife comes out and she was a flamenco dancer professionally. Uh, now touring as his wife, and she starts doing the, the flamenco palmas, you know, do, along with uh, the playing. And they were they were both, we were just like having a gypsy jam session backstage. It was really amazing. And uh, so he said, well, i got to go do my concert. He said, you go out. And then he said, come and see me after the concert, which I did. Uh, and I came backstage again. And then when everything was all cleared away and he had me eyeball to eyeball and his wife was there to translate, he invited me to come to New York City to study with him. I now, now, let me just get, again, perspective, uh, just to kind of, what, what, what was your age at that time? So at that time, I was not quite 18. Okay, so still, still in your teens. I was 18 years old, that's right, because I turned 18 in May, and this would have been, uh, I guess, uh, no, wait a minute, it was before, April, I think it was still 17, not quite turned 18. I got to go back and okay. look exactly which month it was. But anyway, so um, this was uh, this was a great, exciting thing to happen. Wow, is it Carlos Montoya, the most famous flamenco guitarist in the world, 
the one managed by the great New York management and touring the world, has invited me to come to New York City to, to study with him. So that word got out on that and, you know, stories in the newspaper. And I practiced a lot more. And then as soon as I graduated from high school, um, uh, I came from a fairly poor family. I mean, we didn't have a lot of money. So uh, a friend uh, uh, helped me buy a bus ticket to New York City. Um, and uh, I had $35 in my pocket for spending money. And the contact in New York was the uncle of the guy who ran the Mexican restaurant who said he'd give me a job and a place to live uh, and I could help him out. So that was the connection. And I went to New York and took a cab to the Greenwich Village, uh, dropped off in front of this Mexican restaurant. And that started a two year adventure uh, of New York City connecting with the flamenco community there. Carlos Montoya, when he got home from various tours, he would have me come up to his apartment and we would sit there with the uh, Spanish coffee that his wife made. And uh, we would sit there and he would he spoke just enough English to uh, to correct me when I was trying to learn some phrase. And so I became, I guess what they say was the second student that Carlos Montoya ever took in his career. The other one was a female flamenco guitarist named uh, uh, Anita Shear. And she's a California flamenco guitarist who also um, uh, was a big fan of his. So that was a pretty big deal. I, I, I worked at this Mexican restaurant in Greenwich Village, uh, waiting tables late at night. But all during the day, I practiced eight okay. to 10 hours every day. I practiced what Carlos showed me and what I was able to pick up from other flamenco guitarists that I met. And there were two or three of them around Greenwich Village that were playing in coffee houses. And then within a short period of time, I started playing what I knew in the coffee houses. And I spent part of that eight to 10 hours a day was in studios for dancers. New York City had two major studios where flamenco dancers would rehearse and where they would assemble these groups of dancers to put on touring shows under the direction of some famous a flamenco dancer or impresario. So okay. part of my training was spending literally thousands of hours over those two years accompanying the rhythms of flamenco dancers and learning to play the little musical uh, melodies that go between the phrases of a flamenco singer and learning more of the nuances and details of how flamenco is structured. So I had quite a crash course there. Um, and then uh, at the end of the nearly two years, by this time it was, I graduated in 62. So in 64, um, uh, the dancers that I had been rehearsing with uh, formed um, a flamenco troupe that was to play in Carnegie Hall. And uh, normally the uh, rehearsal accompanist is just for rehearsing. And then they have a really big name guitarist come in to actually play in the show. But the dancers liked my performing and my rhythm so much that they insisted that I be with them in the show at Carnegie Hall. So, And then another top of the line guitarist came in and just started improvising along with what I had already figured out as the accompaniment. And we did this incredible show in Carnegie Hall. And then a few months later, we did a return engagement at uh, New, York, New York's Town Hall. And uh, by the way, during that time, they called me by a Spanish name that this famous flamenco singer, uh, Chinin de Triana, um, uh, decided my gypsy name would be Reynaldo Reyes. And so <laughs> it was Reynaldo Reyes in the program at Carnegie Hall and ta Town Hall. But Carlos got wind of it and he said, no, he said, don't do that. He said, other non-Spanish people try to pretend to be Spanish or take Spanish names. He said, I mm -hmm. think you're going to be a success at performing flamenco because you're so good and you, you really feel it. He said, I think you should use your real name because that way when you become well known, it will be you that is known and not somebody you're not. So I well, that, see, that, that's brilliant. Sorry, I, I, I keep interrupting, but I, I just don't want to let some of these thoughts that I'm having go by. <laughs> so at this point, you're maybe 20 I, and, and, and just, just barely 20. Yeah. And yeah, that's it. So you've gone from a ukulele at the age of four or five, whatever it was. Seven ukuleles. Seven. 
piano. And now you've played Carnegie Hall as a flamenco guitarist, yeah. accompanying professional flamenco dancers, yeah. having been taught and tutored and mentored yeah. by one of the, if not the, at the time, most world-renowned flamenco guitarists. That's, that's a good summary, yeah. Yeah. That that is it? yeah <laughs> that really that's head spinning I mean that that really truly is how these things come together yeah yeah, um, yeah. And, and it's just I just, I just wanted to take a second to kind of sum that up in a sentence because it's in, in hearing it just in a sentence I'll be honest with you I would have to go yeah right this kid started a ukulele at the age of seven in Tulsa Oklahoma and now he's playing flamenco in Carnegie Hall you know. Uh, 13 years later, yeah, that would be hard to swallow. But it, it's truly amazing that it's happened. Well, so so now back 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 to uh, real story time. Yeah. So so anyway, that yeah, that uh, was, uh, uh, I and I played I played very successfully in some of these coffee houses, the El Gitano, the Gypsy, and uh, El Cafe Flamenco. And this was at a time when. Uh, um, uh, Bob Dylan was uh, around the corner playing at the uh, Gertie's Folk City, uh, and uh, so it was, it was a heyday of a lot of incredible stuff going on in, in New York City. Um, but then I uh, ran out of, of, of money and, and uh, uh, ability to stay there, and so I took a bus back to Tulsa, and it was at the same time that um, uh, I began uh performing under my real name in some clubs and uh uh coffee houses and things around the area pending my uh uh helping my parents move because my dad was was disabled and and he had us move to Missouri to uh Table Rock Lake uh to run a, a cafe which I kind of took a, a breather helping my family do that and get set up there uh, while I was still trying to orient myself as to how I would pursue the next part of my career. Um, before I left Tulsa to, to do that time in southern Missouri to help uh, with uh, my, my parents uh, settling in there uh, and helping to run this cafe, I had done some fairly significant performances. Uh, one was in Houston, Texas for uh, the King family. Uh, the folks that have the King Ranch, which is a very famous, the biggest ranch in the world, I guess, in, in Texas. And uh, there I met the Senator Tower and the Spanish Consul General and, you know, a few princes and countesses and people in the domestic, in the, in the diplomatic corps who were at this big Mexican Posada party. I didn't think much of it until later, uh, which I'll get to in a moment, which was I I, I knew the with the Vietnam War going on, I was going to be drafted pretty soon. And so rather than hold, put my career on hold until I was drafted, I decided to go ahead and volunteer for the draft, which is something I found out I could do. So I got in the Army, went through basic training uh, in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, I mean, in, uh, in um, what do you call it, uh, uh, here in Missouri, uh, Fort Leonard Wood. And, uh, mm -hmm. so then, and then artillery training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And while I was there, um, I played my flamenco guitar uh, at a talent show on the base of Fort Sill. And the head of the band said uh, 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 during my uh, time of chatting with some people after my performance, he said, uh, hey, soldier, he said, somebody who can play the guitar like that hadn't ought to be shooting cannons. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, I agree. <laughs> And he, he has said, can you play a, a band instrument? He said, I'd love to have you in the band. You're, you're, you're a great musician. And I said, well, no, sir, I don't play a band instrument. Uh, and he said, boy, you sure got good rhythm. I bet you could play the drums. And I said, well, yes, sir, I believe I could. And so they called me over and I did an audition and I actually passed the audition officially wow. to be a drummer. And then I also played, you know, performances all around the area. But then... While I was there at Fort Sill, orders came down for quite a few people, including me, to go to Vietnam. So I got orders to go to Vietnam, had a month off at home, shipped out, and took my concert. By this time, I had purchased a concert flamenco guitar when I was in New York, you know, a, a real 
Uh, now, the flamenco guitar, by the way, is different than a classical guitar, which is uses cypress wood on the sides and back, very light colored, a little thinner in the body. The strings lay very close to the fretboard and to the sound opening to create a more percussive sound. When you hear the two guitars of a flamenco guitar and a classical guitar side by side, you can really hear the difference. It really has a, the flamenco guitar has a real punch. So, and I had learned to really play well on it. So I went off to, to, to Vietnam, uh, but I took my concert flamenco guitar with me. <laughs> in, hmm. in, uh, in an old <laughs> That may have been the only one in the entire country. Well, you better believe it. So it was me with my duffel bag and my concert flamenco guitar. And they thought I was absolutely crazy as a bat. They thought this guy is nuts. You know, uh, so, um, but I, you know, w after I was there in a replacement battalion and they, then they ended up sending me to a band instead of out to shoot cannons because they could have, um, I uh, uh, immediately started playing flamenco guitar and they put me to work as a drummer. Um, they, I started playing at the officer's club and, and eventually I did a major concert, uh, at the Saigon National Conservatory. I did a special TV show. This is during the war we're talking about. I played mm. a full TV show where I spoke enough Vietnamese to introduce the flamenco numbers and, you know, played a concert at the Vietnamese American Association. But while I was there, the reason the Vietnam experience was important uh, besides the fact that I genuinely felt that I was serving my country and wanted to do what I could to to help put an end to this craziness. Uh, that's my felt my reason for being there with with music and art and, you know, the contribution I could make. Although we also had to duck bombs and mortars and do guard duty mm -hmm. and, you know, traveled all over Vietnam to uh, to some of the hot spots. Uh, about 58 trips I made by Huey helicopter and uh chinook and you know c-140s and so we had quite a time of it back in back in the 65 and 66 the years i was there actually left early 67 but during while, while the time i was there i ended up getting this packet of information from this senator tower that i met at that party that i talked about where i'd performed uh before mm -hmm. i got into the army and they had done some research and decided that since i had never studied in spain I had studied with Carlos Montoya, played in Carnegie Hall, you know, and they yeah. thought, well, this guy needs to get to Spain. And so they uh, they came up with all this info for me to get uh, a Fulbright scholarship. I'd heard of Okay, now, now hold, hold that thought. Yeah. Hold that thought, because, again, what I'm trying to do is just wrap all this together, because this is fascinating, and, and it, it's I don't want things to get lost. Okay. So you're in vietnam with with your uh special guitar which is i'm sure the only one in the entire country on either side of the conflict um and what you said that kind of you you kind of just let it go by in passing but i think it's inc another incredible part of your story is you said i think i'm quoting you correctly i knew just enough vietnamese to introduce the flamenco numbers yeah so not only have you picked up all of this musical instrument and picked up the drums that you said almost instantaneously, it sounds like, yeah. you have picked up another language along the way. Uh, so uh, in addition to the language of music and the language of, uh, you know, and, and the message of, of friendliness and love that that brings, you were able to speak in Vietnamese to, to bring people in. So now this kid from Tulsa, Oklahoma <laughs> is in Vietnam, uh, in Asia, explaining to them this music heritage from Spain yeah, in the native language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, That's just another common story. That's what everyone in Tulsa did, right? <laughs> it seemed perfectly natural to me because that you just do whatever it takes to accomplish your vision. And well, see, that's that's kind of what I wanted to hear you say. So thank you. Yeah. You do whatever it takes to accomplish your vision. Yeah. I mean, that's that's that, the message, you know. Uh, and but I, I, I will say that uh, even screwier than that is that is that I had only been there maybe uh, a couple of months playing drums and then going out and playing my guitar for events, which they let me do. Um but um, and they even helped arrange for is that one day the 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 head sergeant um, of the band came up to me and said, Radford, check out a trombone. You're marching. To the front <laughs> <rest tomorrow." laughs> 
one of our trombone players had been rotated back and they had a, they have six trombones across the front. And, uh, um, uh, and I said, but Sarge, I don't play the trombone. And he said, fake it. <laughs> this real, really happened. I checked out a trombone and I, he said, I said, well, what do I do? He said, just, just move your slide when the other guys move their slide, just keep an eye on them and just fake it. Well, actually within three months, I was a good third trombone player, and that was my main instrument the rest of the time I was there. Well, I, that's the way it went. <laughs> that's amazing. And, okay, now back to the Fulbright scholarships. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. I, I didn't know that Fulbright scholarships were available for people in music. Uh, um, I thought it was just strictly academic stuff. But I learned, you know, right away that there that, you know, there's a process for what they call uh, a student at large, which I was. I had never attended a university. Keep in mind, I had only graduated from high school, studied with Montoya, played in Carnegie Hall, um, all that. But uh, what uh, what they figured whenever I put together all of my information, which included a recommendation letter from Carlos Montoya and then a recording audition tape that I had to do at the post library on an old reel to reel tape recorder. I played, I played three numbers labeling them. And, uh, and because of the fact that there was an open microphone, as I recorded, there were helicopter sounds and bombs and mortars going off in the background <laughs> while I was performing. That was the audition tape they heard. And apparently when the package reached uh, Madrid, Spain, they approved it immediately uh, the very day it arrived and said, we want this guy. And so I was awarded a full grant scholarship to spend a year studying flamenco guitar in Spain. And since it's generally graduate level or doctoral level, study, level studies, they came up with a way to show that I had the equivalent of a, of a BA degree in flamenco guitar, if there had been such a thing. <laughs> so uh, I wasn't going to argue with him. I thought, sure. And so I uh, got out of Vietnam, went to, uh, stopped off at home in Lampy, Missouri to visit my folks a little bit and unpack all my gear when it arrived uh, by a shipping truck. Uh, took the bus on to New York City and uh, with my better guitar now that I had, uh, and um, and got on the SS Constitution uh, ship with 35 other Fulbright scholars from around the United States, uh, studying a variety of things, all very smart graduate level people. And, you know, I'm the only guy who just had a high school education, but, you know, I guess I was the unique guy because I was a, I was a, you know, flamenco guitarist. And anyway, so I went over seven days traveling over to Spain and uh, hit it off well with one uh, young guy who, who was about my age. I guess I was a little older than he was. Uh, he was working on his his uh, doctorate in Romance Philology, the study of Romance languages. He and I hit it off really well. So when we got to Spain, uh, we decided to be roommates. So we got an apartment in Madrid and I spent that first year traveling uh, uh, around Madrid mostly, um, going to different uh, flamenco clubs and taking uh, lessons from private lessons from various flamenco guitars and hanging out in bars and clubs, having jam sessions with, uh, with the gypsies that live there and uh, in that culture and immersing myself in, in the culture of, uh, of flamenco as it's done by the people in the flamenco culture of Spain that included some really incredible high energy experiences. And uh, I really loved every moment of it. And, uh, and then I got back to Tulsa after that and subsequently went to the University of Tulsa because I felt influenced by all these brilliant Fulbright scholars in the mm -hmm. academic world, thinking to myself, you know what, I need to get some of that really good, uh, I need to plug my, uh, my uh, computer in here because I realize I had not done that. I'm sorry about that. There you go. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I did. I enrolled at the University of Tulsa. And I in the music department uh, studied uh, composition and theory, and uh, they didn't offer guitar, but I did a recital 
of flamenco guitar anyway, uh, which they found a way to authorize. And, uh, you know, after a couple of years of being at the University of Tulsa studying and doing a few local concerts, I went off uh, to Spain again, this time on a, on a grant from a private foundation that uh, saw that I really needed to go back to Spain and study more. So I went back to Spain again for another year uh, with the uh, Francis Witt Leach Foundation Award. And this time I even got more deep into the culture. Uh, I was able to uh, buy a car and travel down to Southern Spain, which is the birthplace of flamenco, the area of Spain called Andalusia. The Southern provinces, about seven provinces in Southern Spain, uh, which make up the region we call Andalusia. And uh, in the central part of, uh, of that region is where flamenco was born and where it's still practiced as the local folk music. And these are places like Seville and Cadiz and uh, Granada. And so those were the places I hung out, went to a little town of Moron de la Frontera, M-O-R-O-N, Moron, where I studied with a legendary old gypsy guitarist, uh, Diego del Gastor, uh, kind of a, of a simple um, uh, folk country style of flamenco playing, highly influenced by him and uh, loved hanging out with the gypsies and some of their jam sessions there. Um, really had uh, an unbelievable experience of being enmeshed in learning to speak Spanish, of course, very rapidly uh, by this time, uh, more nuanced and with all the local lingo about the art form. So I could kind of fit in uh, with the culture. Um, and uh, some of the stories that I tell in my concert are about experiences that I had down there studying with them and uh, others, just various, you know, experiences that I had going to different cities in Spain uh, sure. to learn the particular style of that region, which I did. So, so speaking of, of your concerts, um, so, so your story and your journey is fascinating and, and I kind of hate to hit the fast forward button, but I also want to be uh, commit, honor my commitment to you on our time. And there's so much more that we want to talk about that takes us beyond uh, I don't want to say just your flamenco music, but that is built on the platform of your of, of your music and and your performing. So you take us fast forward a little bit, please, Ron, into the world of being the concert flamenco guitarist. Your travels uh, and and part of what I want to get to is. Um, some of the things that have come as the result of that, some of the, some of the work that you've done beyond that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Roger McGowan. We're going to talk a little bit about, you mentioned earlier, I don't want to get back to uh, the concerts and presentations you give to school, to, to uh, grade school and high school level people, because there's so much there that has come from this. So again, I, I, I don't want to cut short the story, but I want to make sure we get to the to the really uh, huge payoffs of all of this. Well, it's, uh, so, I, we can compress that, uh, Bill. Uh, yes, uh, when I when I, I, I made a, a variety of different trips to Spain on a different various different concert, a uh, different uh, um, uh, scholarships or or, or funding. Sometimes I would just mm -hmm. borrow money at a bank with some wealthy person co-signing and I would eventually pay it back. So I made a number of trips. But during that time, I continued to develop my career by performing more and more. I got hooked up with the Mid-America Arts Alliance, with the State Arts Council, and started doing performances as much as I possibly could. And I developed this unique style of performing uh, because of the fact that I'm I'm absolutely in love with not just the music, but the culture and the spirit of the gypsy mm -hmm. people and uh, their um, their contribution to the world and how much I learned from them. And so many of the stories that I tell are about that. And I developed this, this kind of concert that is quite unique, uh, I guess, is totally unique in a way, because no one does that, of telling stories about my experience at a particular place where I learned this piece, I'm getting ready to play it. And I tell a story about meeting the people, what I learned from them or some jam session or deal. Okay. And then some kind of a lesson about that. 
and then uh, it paints a picture in the mind of the person in the audience so that they see. And then when I play the music, then the music, they have a place in their mind with this picture and in their emotional feeling part that, ah, oh, that's it. And they can see and feel it. I have people come up to me and say, I heard your concert 30 years ago. And they would tell me almost word for word some story that I told. I still mm. remember what you said. In other words, what I'm finding out as I you know, review my career at this point is that the stories that I tell, the images that I create in, in trying to portray through my passion and love for the mm -hmm. art and, uh, and the culture is as important as the music itself. That led me to develop the ability to speak about why it's important and what it is exactly that I learned uh, by being a concert flamenco performer. And of course I did, I was managed for 10 years by a major New York management agency myself, the Sheldon Soffer Agency. And I played in, you know, they, I did a concert in Carnegie, solo concert in Carnegie Hall and in colleges and universities all of the United States, places like Royce Hall in, at UCLA in California. And, uh, and of course, during that time I played uh, concerts in I guess 12, 13 countries around the world including uh, the trip to Australia while I was in the army and performing there. And, and um, I, uh, I, I started doing programs occasionally, aside from my concert that I would do at a concert hall in a town, I would do assembly programs for schools nearby. And I discovered that I had a real passion for sharing uh, my passion uh, and what it takes to be the best that you can be through practice, what I call the power of practice, uh, or how to be the best that you can be is the title of the program, basically. And that uh, uh, started developing my ability to, to adjust my stories at the grade level of the students that I was performing for, so that I could portray my experience of what it took for me to do what I'm doing, which they were always very impressed with, and really quite amazed uh, because the, most of the time they had never heard flamenco guitar before. And so I developed the ability to, to share uh, this message of uh, that, that it takes uh, uh, discovering something that you're passionate about and, uh, and, and then um, that the, 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 uh, the, 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 the sense of purpose that you have in your life uh, for doing it, uh, what, you, what you really want to accomplish, and then the persistence. It's what I call the three Ps, uh, the, the purpose, the, pa the passion, and the persistence. And the persistence is the part about practice. So I have a message that, that works for all students at all levels, and also a lot of university uh, master classes that I give where I deliver the same message. So that's been a very, very important part and I would say I've gotten as much notoriety and as many rave reviews for my school programs as I have for my public concerts. And um, those public concerts then starting, mostly starting more full time in 2015, I did a tour in, uh, in Europe because I started developing a network of people uh, that were all over Europe. And uh, the way that happened was a friend of mine uh, that I met at a concert I did in 1975, no, 76, in Geneva, Switzerland. I was uh, flown over to Geneva, Switzerland to, to perform in, back in 76. This is not that far away from, you know, when I, I had gotten out of Vietnam just only 10 years before and uh, did my extra studies. But... Uh, this friend of mine and I corresponded and he came to my home to visit every year. He is a writer of, uh, of a variety of books, uh, I think 15 uh, books, a very famous author. And um, he introduced me to, you mentioned the name earlier, Roger McGowan, who was a death row inmate. And uh, he, he enlisted me to be a, a, a helper in, a, in helping to get funds to Roger McGowan. And then he and I started talking about maybe getting a better attorney for him because he had been... Uh, okay. on on death row with a with a date for execution and this friend of mine Roger uh, got uh, in his letters convinced uh, uh, Pierre Pradervan that he was in dire straits so Pierre 
really uh, got some people together, hired an attorney, got him off of uh, the uh, stop, the, the execution. Then I got to know Roger myself with visits there. And uh, Pierre and I, uh, the, the, the famous author from Switzerland and I began uh, a, a search and we found an attorney. We did some fundraising. And by this time, Roger uh, was featured in a major book by Pierre Pradervan called Messages of Life from Death Row. It's available on Amazon, and I'm the U.S. Uh, representative uh, for publishing it uh, through Amazon. Uh, we, in fact, I helped do the English translation of it. It was made so famous in Europe, in in uh, French, and mostly in in Switzerland and France, that it raised enough money for us to hire this attorney, and uh, we we went through over a million dollars in legal fees, and actually ended up getting Roger McGowan off of death row. And now we have another legal team working to prove his innocence. Well, all during that time of working with Roger, I saw what a generous and amazing person that he was, what compassion and interest he has in making a difference in the world himself, being someone who was falsely accused, falsely convicted, and has spent 27 years on death row. This is not, for those of you listening who may be surprised, not that unusual. There are over 300 people that have been exonerated from death row in the United States who were, were convicted uh, uh, through false testimony or uh, withholding evidence or a variety of uh-huh. things, false confessions or whatever. Anyway, so during that time, Roger McGowan and I became fast friends. And as soon as he was able, uh, about six years ago, to have access to the phone, we started talking on the phone regularly, which I would arrange for and fund through donations, which would start coming in from the people that were supporting Roger McGowan and our efforts to to get him out of prison. Well, Roger started uh, an interesting tradition when he was on death row, which was sharing because we would send him money and he would buy things at the commissary, but he would always set them out and share them with other guys doing what they call a spread. That's a prison term for sharing a meal or sharing some of the snacks. Uh And at this prison where he is in Texas now, starting about six years ago, he started doing it on a major scale. And it started transforming the lives of the inmates at this prison because they'd never seen anything like it, where a huge spread of food was put in the day room and everyone was invited to come and eat. Well, they were very suspicious because in prison, usually it's a quid pro quo. If somebody's going to do something for you, they expect something in return. Right. Well, it took a while for Roger to do this. Every uh, The last Friday of every month, we would put on one of these big spreads on his cell block of about 160 guys. And these people would eat together in groups, the Hispanics together, the blacks together, the whites together. Uh, gang members would assemble together and they would, you know, they would not associate with each other. They were very suspicious. But as we started doing these spreads and everybody was welcome to come and eat, they finally broke down and they would say, oh, well, okay, well, what do I have to do for you? And Roger would say, nothing, nothing. You don't understand. If you did something for me, you know, then it wouldn't be unconditional love. He said, that's what we're about. We're about unconditional love. And that's Roger's message for everyone, you know, great, great compassion and love. And so it's transformed the lives of dozens and dozens of inmates. I would say, and others agree with me, that it has actually transformed the culture of this entire prison and perhaps is showing a model of what happens when you treat inmates, um, well, as, as people who are who are more than the worst thing they've ever done. So, so we've just covered a whole lot of geography, a whole lot of things, and and uh, the the Roger McGowan story is one that I think is really incredible. Um, I I would urge people to get the book. The information will be in in the show notes. Uh, but but there's a lot that I want to kind of recap here quickly, if I, if I may, Ron. Um, so. The the wind unit uh, prison in uh, Huntsville. Huntsville. Yeah. Um, what I just heard you say is that it took some time, but people being recognized 
as people. We as humans want, if nothing else, at our very core, we want to feel safe. And that's some of the reasons that we get into the groups that we do and the cliques that we, or the gangs or however you want to put it. Right. And when we're able to show others that you matter to me as a human uh, and I don't want anything from you, over time, that can have a tremendously positive impact. And, and I'm so glad that your story and Roger's efforts are, are making that point so clearly. Um, and, and again, for those interested in kind of supporting or finding out more about this type of information or even the story and, and a better understanding of spread, because not only is it uh, a bunch of food that anyone can have, it's probably, a, or definitely, because I've read it, is a tremendous break from the monotony of prison food. It, it's probably like a monthly yeah. feast like we might have for Thanksgiving that we take for granted that these people look at and go, this is incredible. Yeah, yeah. I must add to, to expand on how this worked. Uh, during the time that we were, that we were working on those spreads on Roger's uh, 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 cell block, the, the word got around the whole prison, 23, 2400 inmates, and numerous people kept wanting to put in transfers to get moved to his cell block because they wanted to be a part of that culture. Well, finally, we had another organization in France, the RRSB, a, a group that were very inspired individuals and started a whole pen pal program. And they started sending money as me as the administrator. And we started funding these uh, spreads on every other cell block in the entire prison and in the dormitories where they have a, a faith based dorm and, a, you know, different dorms and uh just up to the time of the pandemic, what was for it was shut down, we had monthly spreads going on, these big communal meals where people were being recognized, acknowledged, and included in, in the group culture in a way that they had never felt before uh, was taking place in all, all over the entire prison. And unfortunately, that was interrupted by the, by the pandemic, and we're just now slowly getting back, uh, getting back up and running on that. And that's good. And, and that kind of matches uh, the, the general population outside of uh, outside of Wynn Prison. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit because uh, some other really important stuff. Uh, and, and again, we're coming up against the, the timing deadline that I committed to. But I want to go back to what I think has become a really significant and powerful part of your story and that is your general concert style of bringing story along with music and making the entire experience come alive, but how you've taken that to school. So your program, The Power of Practice, How to Be the Best You Can, uh, is something that you bring, and, and I think the program is typically roughly an hour, and it's a combination of talk and storytelling and, and music all coming together. Right. But what you talk about is... Um, you know, you talk about a wow moment and, and for you, a wow moment. And I'm going to quote here. A wow moment is when you realize there is something inside of you, some passion you have that wants to come out. And then you talk about practice and say it's not just doing the same thing over and over. You have to practice with purpose, with passion and with persistence. And I want to come back to the, those three because um those are three words that I use a lot. I call it the purpose principle, uh, where once we discover a purpose that ignites a passion within us, and then persistence allows us to and drives us to continue in our, in our goal, continue in, in the path we're taking, but also to grow and evolve. And sometimes our purpose changes or shifts or takes, takes on a new focus. And that's kind of what your story uh, conveys to me. Um, it does. Uh, thank you. But one more line I want to give, and because I want your comment on it, and uh, it, it talks about you talk about um, you all have something within you that you like to call the gift of unlimited improvement. So you say practice doesn't make perfect, uh, but you say that you all have within you what I like to call the gift of unlimited improvement, which to me suggests another P word, progress. Absolutely. Talk about that for just another minute. Well, uh, um, sure. Um, it's, it's what all of my stories 
allude to because they all include those those three uh, elements. And the progress, of course, is just obvious in the story that I tell of how I became a flamenco guitarist. And if you are true to yourself, if you're authentic and you're operating from this place of passion and heart, uh, that progress is is almost inevitable. You may have setbacks and problems, but you know what to do with them. One of the things that I've done in the last few years with my school program is I've, I've learned to use um, analogies that the students might be more knowledgeable about. Uh, during the time, for example, that Michael Jordan, well, of course, he's still well known even among a lot of, of people. I use his example uh, to illustrate the particulars of the idea of purpose, uh, passion, and persistence. And what I, what, I, what I say is something along the line that every time, first of all, Michael Jordan became the greatest, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, um, not accidentally. It was because he practiced more. He practiced after practice. And he put in more time and more passion than any other performer, I mean, any other uh, athlete at the time. But what he, what he described, and I picked this up in an interview with him uh, long ago, and I love this, this, this particular analogy because it's the way I practice on the guitar. And that is every time, at hundreds and hundreds of hours, so he'd be on the court by himself practicing. Well, what did he do? He wasn't just repeating shots. According to Michael Jordan, every time he held the, foot, the, the, the basketball in his hand and got ready to make a shot, he had a purpose in mind. The purpose was very clear. It was to adjust something about his shot. And so he practiced with a purpose to do a particular thing better. Maybe it had to do with the footwork this time. Maybe it had to do with the way he was holding his fingers, whatever. But he would, he would do that. Every time he made a shot, it was not random or unconscious or repetitious. It was with a conscious purpose. I'm going mm -hmm. to do this shot. And, but what he would do it, he would do it with passion. And that was something that he never lost. And it's something that I have never lost, which is the passion for the craft. It's the passion and love that you feel for it. So you have a particular purpose. You have the passion for it. And then you rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat over and over again with persistence. And that's kind of my sense of how I have developed my technical abilities, my improvisational ability, my capacity to embody the unique specifics of each of these styles of music of the flamenco style. So uh, when I practice, that's what I do. I have a very, very specific goal. I don't just spend hours just playing notes. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I, it's, it is a, an integral thing to do with your way of being. So if it's a phys and, and it's a physical thing that I do with my fingers, then I'm practicing this, but I'm doing it with the purpose of making sure that this finger here is, is replaced by that finger at exactly the same time. And so I'm practicing my scale passages with real detailed granularity of technical knowledge and purpose. And I have passion in my heart. I feel, oh, this is going to what it takes to yeah. get it because I know what the result that I want. That's that sense of passion. And then the persistence, just do it for as many hours and for as many years as it takes. Well, you know, you have, uh, after some 60 plus episodes, you have done something that no one else has done. And I applaud you for that, which is you've given the answer to my final question before I've actually asked you the question. So, so congrats on that, because typically I ask my guest, uh, I end with saying, what's the point? And I think you've just done a beautiful job of summarizing what's the point. And that is very simply yeah. know your purpose. Uh, enjoy and, and use the passion as the fuel and stay persistent and growing. And I, and I love that message because it's one I live by. Uh, Ron, I, I thank you so very much for your time. Uh, Ron Radford, everybody, one of the uh, great flamenco guitarists of our time. And, and uh, there's so much to learn from him and about him. 
There'll be a lot in the show notes, the, the information about Roger McGowan and the entire spread initiative throughout uh, the Texas prison and elsewhere. Um, all of that will be in the show notes. Uh, again, Ron Radford, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. What an incredible story uh, from, from a young boy in Tulsa, Oklahoma to world traveled flamenco artist. It's amazing. And thank you for being here with us today. My pleasure, Bill. Thank you all. Thanks so much for tuning in. And if you like what you heard, please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We can promise you'll gain value in every one. Rating and reviewing makes us more discoverable and helps others find out what's the point. And if you'd like to know more about Bill Ellis or contact him, please visit his website, www.brandingpillars.com. See you next time.